Okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, and so we can get going with this program. Thank you so much for being here. We're so excited that so many of you are here today from all over. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing your time with us. So I'm gonna stop sharing and wonderful. Okay, so welcome everyone. We hope that you are here today because um, you're excited about learning about um, winter seed sowing. And um, we're really excited to share a bunch of information with you all about um, how we how we have learned um, the best practices for this for this process over time. Um, and as you can probably see in this panelist, we have Emily based in here. Um, she's going to be walking us through some seed sowing. And then we also have a seed cam. Um, I'm going to pin both of them in a moment, but um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what you can expect over the next couple um, minutes that lead up to a whole hour. <laughs> so um, as, yes, yeah, so we are the Wild Seed Project. We are um, an organization committed to returning the biodiversity to this place we call home, and we are really excited um, to be sharing um, this time with you. And so I just want to begin this program because we will be engaging with Plants in Place in recognizing that this land that we are leading the program from, that we here at Wild Seed Project are tied to in so many ways, is the ancestral Wabanaki territory we now call Maine. We recognize the inherent sovereignty of the tribes of the Wabanaki, the people of the Don, the Abenaki, Holton Band of Maliseed Indians, Mi'kmaq Nation, Penobscot Nation, and Passamaquoddy Tribe, and honor their relationships to the plants, animals, and other beings that have been threatened and displaced through settler colonialism. The purpose of this acknowledgement is to allow this understanding to shape our work. Our work is dependent on reckoning with the historic and present day violence of colonization. In addition to violent, violently displacing the indigenous people that have cared for this land since time immemorial, the exploitative values and practices of settler, settler colonialism are directly responsible for the displacement of the important plants that form the foundation of our local food webs. We wanna let the knowledge of the depth and the breadth of the legacy of displacement guide us today. From this understanding, we can ask ourselves, what does it mean to build and rebuild reciprocal relationships with people, plants, fungi, soil, water, and air? Reestablishing resilient ecosystems in which all forms of life can thrive is an important action in deconstructing colonial legacy. We also want to recognize that while we are sharing these resources with you all, um, these skills and this information did not start, nor should they end with us. We are sharing the guidance and knowledge from so many teachers acquired in both reciprocal and extractive ways, and we recognize the gift of this knowledge and hope that you will continue to share these learnings outside of this hour we have to together today. We also want to just send gratitude to all of the plants that are so many of our teachers, because really, as you will hear through Emily's explanation, the best way to learn how to sow seeds is to watch plants sow their seeds and then just mimic that in the um, in the like most kind of squared way possible. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to hand it over to Emily. Emily Baisden is our seed programs director for the Wild Seed Project. Um, she has a lot of experience with plants and bugs and food webs and is a whole host of knowledge. So any sort of question, start putting those in the question and answer because I almost guarantee she has the answer. Um, and the format of today is going to run that I will pin Emily and our seed cam. Um, they will, they, Emily and the seed cam will show you how to sow seeds. It's just Emily's hands in the seed cam. Um, and that will last about 30 minutes. Um, and then we'll have about 15, 20 minutes for questions at the end. So um, again, we have a lot of gratitude for all of you here today. And I'm going to turn it over to Emily. So thanks so much. Awesome. Hi, folks. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, let's see. There we go. And we can see it both. Um, I'm Emily Baisden, like Nell said, I'm the seed program director, and I'm going to talk to you all today about growing native seeds um, in your backyards or in your patios or wherever you have available to grow native seeds. Um, it's winter. There's a little bit of snow still on the ground here where we are in North Yarmouth, Maine. Um, 
And a lot of people think that this is not a great time to plant plants, but it's actually the perfect time to plant our native seeds. Um, like Nell was saying earlier, we've found that really the best way to try to grow these plants from seed is to mimic what they do in nature. And if we think about uh, when a lot of our plants go to seed, it's in the fall and a lot of them are still dropping their seed really throughout the winter. Um, so you might be able to guess that they're not just adapted to having these sort of New England weather scenarios of rain and snow and freeze and thaws and things like that, but they actually require it, many of them. Um, many of our native seeds have very, very thick seed coats and they've adapted over millennia um, to require these freeze and thaws to break down that, that thick seed coat. Um, and some horticulture world uh, gets around that by putting seeds in the fridge and out of the fridge and into the fridge and out of the fridge, but we find we can just put our seeds outside. Um, so I'm gonna go over all the steps needed to, to grow your seeds with a few different examples of three kind of common shapes of seeds. So I'll be planting swamp milkweed today, I'll be planting New England aster, and I'll be planting cardinal flower. Um, it has been a very wet year, so I chose three plants that are highly adapted to wet conditions. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about each species as I sow them. But first and foremost, let's talk a little bit about the supplies that you're going to need for seed sowing. Um, one of the really lovely things about sowing native seeds is it doesn't really require high tech um, supplies. You don't need a greenhouse. You really don't need um, much more than a pot and soil and seeds. Um, but I'm going to go over each thing right now. So first and foremost, you want a pot. I like a nice sturdy um, plastic pot. Uh, it'd be great if we could get away from plastic. Uh, a lot of people will reuse um, milk containers and things like that, totally fine. The big thing is finding something that can survive outside for at least a year. Um, and a lot of the like cow pots and things like that can't hold up for a winter, um, but there are things that do. So feel free to uh, not do plastic if that's not your game. I just can reuse this for so many years. It seems to be um, the thing that I've been going with lately, um, but, but a nice solid pot that can survive a winter uh, and then a whole growing season after the winter. Um, so that's your pots. The next thing you're gonna need is soil. Um, we use a compost-based organic potting soil. Um, it's really important to try to go organic if you can. Um, you know, the, the big point of us wanting to increase biodiversity means uh, not hurting our biodiversity. So we want to try to go organic um, to keep all those microbes and everything happy. Um, a lot of times when I talk about seed sowing, I talk about the difference between uh, native plant seed sowing and vegetable seed sowing or annuals or um, more commonplace seed sowing. And one of the major differences um, with vegetable seed sowing is the type of soil you use. A lot of our uh, seed starting mixes are a really lightweight peat based soil. They tend to be fairly um, uh, sterile soils, which in a greenhouse, it's good to have sterile stuff because you don't grow as much mold and things like that. But we find our native plants really like a microbe compost, um, organic matter rich soil. Um, there are a few peat free mixes on the market. Um, they're becoming more popular. They're hard to get your hands on sometimes. Um, what I'm using right now is a Living Acres brand compost-based potting soil. It does have some peat, but it's not peat dominant like a lot of um, other seed starter mixes and things like that. It's mostly compost-based, um, but there's several you can go for. And a lot of people have gotten into making their own, which is totally doable as well. Um, but yeah, having having that live organic matter is really a good way to, to start your seeds off really well. Um, the other nice thing about it not being so lightweight is remember these plants, these seeds are going to be spending their whole life outside. Um, so the really light soils don't tend to stay in place the way we want them to, and they don't tend to, to pack quite as well. So the next thing you're going to need besides soil um, is labels. Uh, it's really important that we label our plants. It's really easy to mix them up, and a lot of plants look very, very similar when they're young. Um, I once again, I'm using plastic labels, um, though I do find if I write my information with a pencil, I can rub it off when I'm done using it and reuse these labels for a very long time, which is great. Um, we use pencil because we find it lasts the whole time. Um, like I said, we can 
reuse it if we need to. I find the uh, Sharpies and things like that don't tend to last very well. Um, I've heard people have had use with some um, more wax-based things. So find something that works, but the big thing is to be able to have your information so you can check it um, whenever you want. And when I actually sow seeds, I'll talk about what goes on the label. Um, so the next thing you're gonna need is sand. That brings me to another uh, major difference in how we sow our seeds. Instead of covering our seeds with soil, we cover them with sand. Um, and there's a few major reasons why we do that. For one, if we think about freeze and thaws and how soil can heave, um, sand doesn't quite heave quite as much. It um, doesn't move around as much, so it can hold your seeds in place a little bit better through uh, those New England or Northeast weather conditions. Um, sand also still allows some sun to penetrate through, uh, and it really just holds the seeds in place in a nice way. Um, it also, we use this coarse ground builder sand. It's like quick creep brand, um, all purpose sand. Um, and because it's so gravelly, it's able to help break down and nick at that seed coat. If, remember, we want to try to mimic what happens in, in the wild. And when the seeds fall out of the plant, they're not being dug into the ground as often. I mean, sometimes squirrels will do that, but for the most part, they're landing on the ground and they're getting grizzled by various matter on the ground. Um, and we're kind of trying to mimic that. Um, so that's the sand and I'll talk about uh, how to use the sand when we actually sow the seeds. Um, so you'll get more about that. Um, but the biggest important thing with the sand is to make sure it's clean. The package will say if it's washed, um, don't use municipal sand. It often has um, chemicals and salts and things like that. Um, uh, don't use beach sand because it's usually quite salty unless you're growing something like seaside goldenrod. The seeds probably won't do too well with that much salt. So really just having a washed sand um, that you can get. Unfortunately, these bags tend to come in like 50 pound bags as the smallest size. So you really only need to buy one. They're fairly cheap, luckily. One bag for a very long time does the average person um, pretty well. Um, so that's the pots, the soil, the sand, the labels. Um, and the last thing that you're gonna need uh, supplies wise, not counting the seeds, is this wire mesh. Um, you can get this hardware cloth or wire mesh um, in any sort of garden center. Really all of this stuff can be found in your average garden center. Um, this is quarter inch wire mesh. They also sell half inch, both works. Um, the important thing about this is to keep critters out. Um, if we think about seeds and we think about how many seeds a plant produces um, in a season, it can be millions and millions of seeds, right? But the reason they're uh, producing that much is because most of them don't become a plant. Most of them become food for something else. And we're trying to avoid that because we want to be able to plant these plants out in the fall. Um, so it's really useful to have something like this to keep critters out and not build a little buffet of your seeds. Um, so just a slice of hardware cloth mesh put over your pots when you put them outside. And I'm going to repeat this at the end too, um, will help protect the seeds. What I use in the nursery um, are cold frames that are um, the tops and bottoms are covered in this wire mesh. And I'm able to put lots and lots and lots of pots full of thousands and thousands of seeds into those frames to keep things like squirrels and chipmunks and mice out. The big thing is having something that a little creature's hand can't get through um, to eat those seeds. And I'm gonna put up a quick picture of the, um of the cold frames that we use so that you all can get an idea of what we mean when we say this. So I'm gonna share my screen for, again for a second. Um, and you can see, let me put this into slideshow, that we have, as Emily was saying, the cold frame with the wire mesh at the bottom. Um, and then tons of seeds. Um, how many seeds do you think are in that area? <laughs> Potential plants. <laughs> thousands. Many oh, thousands. Many of thousands. Seeds. And then we also have, so that's kind of the frame. It's just like a raised garden bed. Um, but then you can also put the wire mesh on top. And this is to just bring home the point that we really mean leave it outside um, when we say leave it outside. And that's what our cold frames looked like after a big snow last winter. So um those are just hopefully some visuals that might help. Obviously, this is a big scale, but um, there are smaller scale versions of this that work too.
Great. Thank you. Now, yeah, people get really creative with it. So I encourage you to, you know, use that creativity brain and, and figure out what works best for you and what areas that you have um, and what you can reuse. Uh, a lot of people have stuff laying around that they've been holding on to and they know they were going to use it for something. Um, you can use it for seed sowing. Um, so the last thing, maybe the most important thing in all of this is our seeds. <laughs> um, for the Wild Seed Project, for our um, seed packets, generally one packet is enough to um, sow one to two of these pots. Um, so that's kind of our rule of thumb with the packets. Uh, so like I said, I've got three different species to show today, um, and we're going to get going on it. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed's a fairly large seed you can see here in our little uh, vessels. Um, so this, this plant is going to um, get planted somewhere sunny with potential little shade. It can handle quite a bit. Um, and it'll have a little pink flower. We all know milkweeds as being the host plant to the monarch butterfly. So they're really popular right now. Um, and let's get to sowing. So I've got my pot. I'm going to collect my soil. So this is going to be one of the, the differences that I'm going to note about um, sowing seeds first sowing native seeds versus sowing um, uh, like annuals or uh, vegetables and things like that. So I'm going to put my soil in and I'm going to use this separate pot to press it down. So remember I was saying the um, seed starter mixes tend to be really light and fluffy. That's because those seeds really like a fluffy medium. Um, but remember we're mimicking what's happening outside uh, and, and outside's not that light and fluffy, right? So we want to pack down the soil um, heavy enough that it's it's a fairly solid soil base, um, but light enough that water can still drain through. So normally, since I'm inside, I'm not actually going to do this, but normally I would have my soil in this pot and I would um, water it lightly with my little watering can um, and really, really soak this, uh, this soil well. Um, I find that it's nice to water the soil before first um, and get it really wet because then I, when I water, if I water after I've sown, it kind of splashes the seeds around and they don't stay in place as well. So that's kind of a little technique that I've found that works really well um, and keeps, keeps things where I want them to be. So that's the soil. Now, so that everybody can see it, it can be hard to see um, seeds on soil. I've got this little plate here with, I hope you can see it, there's a little outline of the pot size and I'm just gonna sprinkle the seeds on there so everybody can, can get a really good look. You'll be able to see these guys pretty well, but. So one of the other major differences of sowing native plant seed versus um, some of our like Mediterranean annual vegetables is that they really like to be close together. Often when you get a seed packet, um, like say you're growing spinach or something, you get a seed packet and it says um, exactly two inches between each seed and things like that. That's not the case with this type of plant. Um, they really like to be sown tightly together. They remember, like I said before, I'm going to keep saying it, um, we're mimicking how things grow in the wild. Normally native seeds or seeds drop from a plant and they've got other plants around them and other seeds and things like that holding them in place. So if we put a whole bunch of seeds in one spot, they can help hold each other up as they grow. Um, and they seem to do much better that way. I'm just going to hold that up. You can see how close together these really are in the pot. Um, it's okay for them to be touching uh, and they'll just, they'll grow up together and it'll help um, strengthen the stems a little bit. Uh, so that's how we do that. And I'm just gonna tuck that back in my hand. And I love to do a little pinch method. So I like to put some seeds in my hand and then pinch it along the top of the pot. And since I didn't water the soil this time, um, when I'm done here, I will take the pots outside and water the soil because these seeds are not going to go to waste. We are going to actually grow them on. Um, we can give a little update in the spring when they start to grow because I'm sure they will. <laughs> and then there we go. I've got my seeds in my pot. Everybody get a good look at that. Um, so the next step is 
really before I even cover them with the sand is to label them. Um, so I'm gonna label my swamp milkweed. And what I usually do is I put the, the name, you can do common name or Latin, whichever, doesn't really matter. I put the name, I put um, any information about the seed. So if I um, know like the lot number, or if I know what year I collected the seed or where I collected it from, I put any of that information on. Um, and then on the back of my label, I always put the date, today's date, which is the 12th. Um, and that helps really well for tracking. So if something doesn't germinate or if it's something that takes say two years to germinate, I can really track it well. Um, and then I push the, the label really far down, as far down into the pot as I can get it. Because remember we do get freezes and thaws and heave can happen and no matter what labels can disappear and then you still are figuring out what your plant is. But um, so that's the next step. And last, but certainly not least, is the sand. So I'll grab that. So for sand, um, our general rule of thumb is we cover the seed equal to the depth of the seed. So say you have an acorn that's about an inch, you're gonna want a full inch of soil on top of that acorn. Um, so the larger seed, the more sand. Uh, the only time this differs is when it's a seed that requires light to germinate. And my last seed that I'll talk about is one of those seeds. Um, I have been finding um, as our climate changes and things get, uh, you know, we have to adapt to, to the ongoing changes that we're faced with. Uh, there are way heavier rains and storms, um, really lots of rains and small amount of time. And that's been splashing my seed out a little bit more uh, than it used to. So for some seeds, especially things like milkweeds, I'll be, I'll put a little bit more sand than I used to. Um, I'm also, you can, if you can see there, I'm also putting it below the soil level, below the lip. So I'm giving them a little bit more room there. So there's less splashback, um, and less seed jumping into pots next to each other. And sprinkle that on. Swamp milkweed's a great plant. Um, Maine is home to previously home to four different milkweed species. Two of them are considered extirpated from the state. Swamp milkweed is one of those, um, but people are growing it and um, at least introducing it to their properties. Uh, and it is host plant still, like I said, to the monarch butterfly. It's also host to a whole bunch of other creatures. Um, it's just a very, very great all around plant. It is one of our more shade tolerant milkweeds, which is nice. Um, poke milkweed is the other one, um, which is not as commonly found in the trade though. So this one's a good one if you have part shade um, or full sun. So that's that for the milkweed and I'll be watering that um, after this event. So that's milkweed. The next type of seed that I'm gonna show is our fluffy seeds. Um, so this is New England aster. It's another uh, wetland loving species. It really likes sunny, wet areas. Uh, it can also handle part shade. Um, you notice that we leave the fluff on our seeds. Um, a lot of times when you buy seed, the fluff has been removed. That requires some machinery and extra labor. Um, and it's really not necessary. Remember if this, this seed doesn't remove its fluff in the wild. It goes and lands, floats away on the wind and lands somewhere and then hopefully germinates and grows or else gets eaten. Um, so we leave it on. Um, I've heard tell that if you try to grow with fluffier seed in greenhouses, it can produce more mold. But since we're growing outside, we don't seem to have that problem. Um, so once again, I'm gonna grab my soil. And we're gonna pack it down nicely. I'm gonna leave that nice lip there. So there's plenty of room. And I'm gonna, I don't think I need the plate for this one because they're pretty light seeds. I'm gonna take a little pinch. This is probably a hundred seeds, maybe more um, in my hand here. It seems like a, small amount, but it's actually quite a bit of seed. Um, I probably don't even need quite this much. Um, and I'm gonna carefully sprinkle it all along the pot. The actual seed is quite small. Um, 
the fluff makes it seem a lot bigger than it is. Uh, and I can carefully spread them out so it's a nice even surface area. And that should do it. So like I said, this seed is much smaller than the milkweed seed, so it's going to need a lot less sand. Um, and you will be able to see the fluff come up because the fluff isn't actually part of the seed, right? The actual seed is it's a very tiny bit. Um, so I'm going to write my label, my New England Aster. The year of the seed. And my date. Put the label deep in the pot and then I'm gonna cover it with the sand. These seeds do not require light to germinate. Um, so in the past I would have done actual equal to the depth of the size of the seed, but I'm gonna do a little bit more this time because the fluffies do tend to, to rise up, especially in a storm. And then I don't want them to blow away during these like crazy windstorms we've been having. But I can still see a little bit of the fluff there um, and the seed is still covered a bit. Um, and don't be surprised if you, you know, put your seeds out um, and you go check them and some of them have risen to the, the higher parts of the sand. That's totally fine. That's supposed to happen. Um, plenty of them do that. You don't have to go back out and try to shove them back in. Um, it will be fine. So that's New England aster. That works for any of the fluffy seeds, any of the asters, the golden rods, um, things like that, Joe Pie weeds. So the last one is the um, cardinal flower. Um, this guy does require light to germinate. Um, I love to try to see if people want to guess how many seeds this is. Uh, they're very, very dust-like, fine, fine seeds. Um, they're also a wetland plant. Uh, there's just probably millions of seeds in this one little vessel here. Um, so that's something that's important to remember is when you're doing these tiny seeds, um, if you're going to fill an entire four inch pot, that means you're probably going to end up with a lot more plants than say like a milkweed that, um, you know, they're bigger seeds, so less surface area. So I've got my um, soil packed down there. And this one I am going to put on the plate. It really stick to your hands. So one tiny hand pinch like that, that's probably 500 seeds in my hand right there. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, so I do a very light sprinkle. It's uh, kind of like if you were to heavily season um, a dish with salt. I'm a big salt fan, so it's really a kind of a normal seasoning for me. But <laughs> um, as you can see, I still have quite a bit in my hand there. So I just did a little pinch. Um, and I'm dumping it back in my container and all of this extra seed will go back into storage, but hold this up there, see if you can see it. Uh, very, very, very fine seed. And then I'm gonna tap that back into my hand and sprinkle it onto the pot. Cardinal flower is one of my like all time favorite plants. Um, it's one of the few plants that I can collect in my kayak, one of the few seeds, which is really nice. Um, it is a huge attractor to hummingbirds. Um, I stopped using hummingbird feeders completely when I started planting um, cardinal flower and bee bombs um, and jewelweed in my yard because um, hummingbird feeders are a lot of maintenance uh, and I don't have the time for that. But my plants do a really good job at attracting hummingbirds into my yard. Not sure if you guys will be able to see it in the soil, but it's a very uh, even fine dusting of these seeds. Um, I'm gonna label them again.
Okay, so these guys, you'll notice um, that everywhere you buy seeds from is going to have germination codes. Um, and the germination codes essentially tell you uh, if they need a cold period, how much of a cold period they need, um, and if they need any other conditions. So this one will need, will have two different germination codes. So it's going to say um, that it needs a cold period and how long that is. And it's going to say that it needs light to germinate. Um, and that's a big sign that uh, you need to do a very, very fine amount of sand. So you're only going to do just enough sand to really hold that seed in place. Um, thankfully, sand does allow some light to penetrate, um, but really it's the point is to help nick that seed coat and hold the, the seed in place. So I'm going to take a very small amount of sand in my hand here and very, very lightly sprinkle it. Um, you'll still see soil in the pot coming through. You'll just, it's almost about the same amount of sand as seed, similar to seasoning. All righty. All right, so that should do it for my cardinal flower. You can see there, I pulled it up. You can still see quite a bit of soil. You can still see some of the seeds in there. Um, it's just a light amount of sand to help hold everything where, where I left it. So great. That's the three species that are sown. Now let's talk about um, next steps and then we can get into some of the Q&A aspect of this. So I've sowed these plants, right? These seeds that will hopefully become hundreds of little baby plants. Um, now, where do I put them and what do I do with them? So first I'm gonna take them outside and water them. And then I'm gonna find a somewhat protected outdoor, um, fairly level area to put them in. So it's gonna be somewhere that can still get snow and rain and things like that. Um, I like to put them under a deciduous tree. Oaks are really great, but um, under some sort of tree or on the north side of a house somewhere that's, um, not gonna get extreme sunny weather, but still have all, all of the elements. Um, and with that area, I'm gonna remember to take my wire mesh and some rocks or some bricks or something and just hold it down there. Um, these ones will actually come to Turkey Hill Farm where we're growing our seeds. So they'll go into our seed frames. But at my house, what I tend to do is I, um, tuck my pots between some of my um, growing frames. I grow my, all my veggies in above ground beds um, and I'll tuck my pots between them and just cover them with this uh, mesh and put some rocks over it to hold it down. And it, it does a pretty fine job. Um, so then you can just leave them out all winter uh, and it's really important to start checking them in the spring. Um, different species will start to um, germinate and emerge at different times from, from other species. So some will start to emerge in the colder early uh, April period, and some don't start to emerge until it starts to actually get warm. Um, last year was a little bit weird because it didn't get warm until way late. Some of our plants didn't germinate until like July. <laughs> um, so I always say, hold on to them. Don't give up hope. Even if they don't germinate the first year, sometimes just holding on to them for another year is enough for them to break that dormancy and keep going. Um, so you will need to start thinking about watering in the spring, depending on what type of weather we have. We didn't have to water a lot last year, but the previous year we did have to water a lot more. Um, so keeping an eye on making sure your soil is not really drying out. You'll see it like separate from the sides of the pot. That means things are have dried out too much. Um, and just do a gentle watering um, and then they'll start to germinate. The other funny thing about these um, seeds that have been collected from plants, um, each seed is its own unique genetic individual. Um, so they're not gonna be timed quite the same as some of these um, selected for vegetable seedlings. So that's the other thing, when you get a, a veggie seedling packet, it usually says um, this amount of days for germination, right? Um, this doesn't tend to happen with these plants. You'll see a few start to germinate and then over weeks, um, the rest of them will germinate and fill. 
so then the next thing you'd want to look at once you've got little plants growing is to think about dividing your plants or up potting them. Um, generally, we say the best time to plant is the fall. Um, and usually you can grow on your pots until the fall and they're big enough to go right in the ground then. Um, but occasionally we uh, end up with crowded pots and plants that have really grown and, and overcrowded each other. And you can do some dividing. We have some videos on our YouTube that um, we could share in the chat about dividing plants, but there's a few different ways you can do it. You can really just take an entire pot and put it into a bigger pot. You don't have to worry about anything more than that. And that's usually enough to spread the plant out. But if you're someone like me, who's either growing in nursery style or growing in a way that um, you wanna have several individual clumps of plants, you can divide one of these pots into um, like several different clumps of plants. We generally say try not to divide anything more than three to 10 individuals or anything smaller than three to 10 individuals per pot. The only time I do one individual is if I'm using trees because I, I don't want two trees growing next to each other. But for something like this New England aster, um, when this pot is really full and it will be just full of little seedlings, um, I'll divide it into little clumps into the same size pots. Um, and put them out. And then usually I can plant them in the fall. And we'll do another quick just um, image share of some recently um, germinated tiny plants. And they're so cute. Those are um, irises and some partridge pea, which is a native annual. Um, and you can see how like densely covered those areas are. Um, and there was a great resource put in the chat um, of to help identify emerging seedlings of um, native plants of the Northeast. So um, thank you for dropping that in. And then um, as Emily was talking about up potting, these are kind of some, the like big clump of seedlings that have been taken out. You can almost see their square shape and be given the whole clump is given more space. Awesome. Wonderful. Emily, any last thoughts before we move on to the Q and A? Um, I think we're good to go into questions. Awesome. Okay. Well, a lot of good ones. Yes. Oh, here we go. Great. Um, so yeah, thank you all for putting all, so many questions, um, in the Q and A. Emily, I don't think you've been privy to this, but because you've been so focused on sewing, but there are, I think over, almost like 30 questions that um, also with many thanks to Andrea Berry, our executive director is sitting in her office, rapidly typing answers to them. So, um, but thank you all for your curiosity and your questions um, and piecing things that we're talking about together with other things that you've been wondering. Um, and I think that the first big kind of like um, question is thinking a little bit about um, seed harvesting we got some questions about how like what the best practice some best practices for seed harvesting um some like how one gets into this do we have workshops on this um and so if you want to talk a little bit about how those seeds even got here that might be a good place to start yeah that's great um so seed collecting and seed harvesting there's kind of two different uh group groupings that you can put them in there's there's wild collecting so um going out into the out not your own property basically and collecting um and then there's collecting from garden seed and collecting from plants that you've grown uh, and continuing on their progeny um there's some much more strict guidelines that we like to adhere from for wild collected seed um so Number one, make sure you have permission to collect from wherever you want to collect from. So try not to go on to someone else's property or even land trust properties. Um, most of those places have some sort of rule about collecting and plant matter and things like that. So make sure you have any permissions to go onto those places um, and make sure your populations are in adequate size that it's you're not taking from um, uh, an important community. Um, Make sure you absolutely know the species that you want to collect from. So I always encourage people to get to know that species in all four seasons, um, because when it's time to go collecting seed, a lot of these, especially things like asters, a lot of these plants are very, very hard to tell apart. 
um, once they're in seed. So it's really important to know it as a young plant, know it as a flowering plant, and know it as a plant that's in its fall foliage or fall um, structure. Uh, so once it's gone brown and things like that. Um, so those are really important ones. Uh, the next one is to make sure you have an adequate population size that you're taking from. Um, so depending on the species, you would want to make sure you have like at least 100 individuals in an area to collect from. Um, and when collecting, we say a good rule of thumb um, is to never collect more than 5% of the population, 5% uh, of seed from a population, which if you think about a large field of goldenrod or something like that, 5% of that seed is way, 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 way more than any person needs. That's like a truck full of seed. Um, so 5% sounds small, but it's actually quite a lot. And it's usually way more than the average person needs. Um, so making sure you're taking small amounts and amounts that you're actually going to use, you don't need to take more than you think you're going to actually use. So remember, seeds are tiny and they don't take up a lot of space. So try to be uh, aware of that when you're collecting to not grab so much that then you then it just goes to waste. Um, and also when collecting, it's always good to try to collect from several different individual plants rather than getting all of that 5% from one plant. That's going to give you more genetic variability, more um, uh, higher distribution of genes from different plants, which is always good. Um, diversity is good in all forms, including genetic diversity. You get way more chance of interesting adaptations when having a more mixed gene pool. Um, so those are the, the really, really important wild collecting things. When you're collecting from your own garden, you can be a lot more, you know, decisive about it. You can take all the seeds. Some some plants you might not want reseeding, so you can take all of their seed and store it um, and do things like that. But especially if you're if you're wild collecting, you got to be careful about how you're affecting the population. Always think about that. Um, and then some rule of thumbs for knowing when things are ripe when they're collected. Um, a lot of these fluffy seeds. Um, a lot of seeds. In general, you can use the rule of thumb that if it comes right off the plant very easily, then it's probably ripe. If you have to tug at it at all, it's not ripe um, and you need to leave it on the plant until it's ready to, to be removed. Um, a lot of uh, times we'll also encourage you to go, like I was saying before, these plants will ripen over long periods of time and they'll drop their seed over long periods of time. So if you go out a few different times um, and collect from these plants, you can get a wide, wider range of seed too that's ripened all at different times. Um, and you can, can keep storing that. Um, so make sure it's ripe, make sure it comes out um, easily um, and then store it properly. So we, it's really important that you um, dry your seed um, before you sow it and in the wild, that's what happens. It dries on the plant and eventually like falls off as it starts to dry and then it continues to dry in like the, what used to be dry fall times. Um, and it, then you can, what we do for, for these dry storage seeds is we keep them in paper bags. Um, I've gotten very, everybody makes fun of me because there's certain bags that I, I really like for different things. For these really, really dusty seeds, having some sort of envelope with a folded bottom is really, really good um, because these seeds will just drop out. Thank you, Maura. So something like this, I hoard little manila envelopes um, and things like that. Some, some of the jewelry envelopes are really nice because um, they hold really tiny beads and things like that for dusty seed. Um, for fluffier seed, you can use just kind of like a grocery store paper bag. I do like a bag with a handle. It's easier to collect the seed. Um, you can flick it right off into the, the bag um, right on your wrist, which is nice. Um, for, for things like milkweeds, um, <laughs> milkweed's a little bit trickier because once it's fluffed, um, it's a lot harder to manage. Uh, and there is a way where you can check the ripeness of a milkweed um, and I do have there, I think there's a video somewhere that we can share with you guys about how to tell with milkweeds ripe and the best way to clean that seed. Um, but if you get a fluffed out milkweed, you can put it in a paper bag and just shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, and it'll separate the seed from the fluff. Um, and then you can open that bag and all the fluff floats out. Uh, don't do that inside because your staff won't love you. There will be fluff floating around your office. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, but all of these can be stored dry. There are um, kind of three classes of seed. There's ones that can be stored dry and refrigerated for very, very long periods of time. There are seeds that can be stored dry for short periods of time. And then there are seeds that can never be stored dry. And we do sell a handful of those seeds. Um, we call them uh, moist stratified seeds. So they can never grow, dry out um, or the seed dies. Um, a lot of those are like our berries and our fruited plants. Um, so a lot of the dogwoods and the viburnums and things like that, we uh, keep moist to, to bring them, to, to plant them. Um, so I collect those into Ziploc bags um, and squish them up. Uh, the whole idea with that is to, to kind of mimic the digestive system of an animal. A lot of these seeds are dispersed and planted by birds. Um, so I'm trying to mimic the crop of the bird. Remember, we're always trying to do um, what happens in nature. Um, and a bird will eat a seed, they don't have teeth, it gets ground up in their crop, um, and then it goes through their digestive system and then they poop it out and the plants grow. Um, I'm not gonna do that. So I'm gonna put my seed in a bag and squish it up and that helps masticate it. And then I'm gonna let it ferment for a week or two. Um, and that helps kind of mimic a digestive system and the acidicness uh, of a stomach. So those are kind of the two, the, the two major groups of seeds that we work with. Um, and once they're effectively dried in their paper bags, I leave them in paper bags for weeks. They can, they can really go for, for a very, very long time. But since we're storing them for sale, uh, we do keep them in a refrigerator once they've dried out effectively. Um, and then uh, we just keep everything in jars that are properly labeled with where they came from and what year they were collected with. Um, and then they stay in the refrigerator at about 45 degrees um, and they can last for several, several years um, in that kind of storage. And we do offer a lot of workshops for um, in the fall of seed collecting and seed uh, sowing workshops. So if you're around and want to do any of those with us, keep an eye out. Awesome. And there are some questions also about sowing um, seeds that are like coming from berries or um, how, um, the, yeah, there was another question about having to soak, remove, or nick the fruit from seed and seed coats from fleshier seeds. So if, yeah, that might be a nice segue into talking a little bit more about um, the non-drier, non-dry seeds that we work with. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. The, the moist stratified seeds are a different uh, thing. And we, we talked about whether or not we wanted to cover them here, but I just didn't have any on hand. Um, and it's really done the same way unless it is something that needs to be scarified. And that's when you would nick the seed coat. I really like to use sandpaper to scarify. Um, just seems safer to me than using trying to nick the seed coat with the razor blade. But the idea with that is some seeds have such a strong seed coat um, that you can help break it down by, by nicking the seed coat a little bit. Um, and my favorite example, this one's not a moist stratified seed, but my favorite example are the peas. So things like partridge pea and um, sundial lupin, you can, a lot of times like it'll say, it requires 120 days of cold period, but you can really get around that cold period um, by nicking the seed coat. And that's really why it has such a long cold period is because the seed coat's so hard and it takes that long for that much snow and ice to break it down. Um, but you can use um, so just some sandpaper and put the seed on it and rub for about 15 to 20 seconds. And then I put those seeds into like a glass jar with water in it and I soak them overnight and then I sew them. Um, for things like um, dogwoods and stuff like that, uh, beach plum is a good example. Sometimes those just take two years to germinate. Um, I don't scarify them. Usually I just put them in their pots with the sand over them. They get much more sand because the seed is much larger. Um, when I for, for sale, for selling them, um, we clean the flesh off of the fruit completely. And then we put them in little Ziploc bags with um, vermiculite, with moist vermiculite that keeps the humidity up, keeps the seed wet. Um, and then we put a big stamp on the bag that says so immediately. Um, so people know to get it in the pots as soon as they can. A lot of those seeds um, 
it's best to sew them as soon as you get them. You don't want to store them for too long. Oh. Sorry, I'm unmuted. There we go. <laughs> Um, I said, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And I think that, um, the, another question is about just continuing to talk about the transplanting process. Um, and especially about like when they're going into the ground, like when they're finally going into the ground, how many plants should be going into the ground? What should you be looking for to know that like they're ready and the ground is ready and all that stuff. Right. Great question. Um, and I am, I'm hoping to do some at least transplanting workshops this spring. So keep an eye out for those, um, where we can work on actually getting some, some hands-on plants that have grown and are ready to be divided and transplanted. Um, so as far as out planting, um, generally a plant is fine to go when it's got a good four to six inches of above ground growth. It can get planted in the ground. Um, but that you will want prepared ground. So you don't want to plant them right into grass where they have to compete with other plants. You're going to want to actually open up an area of open ground for them to go in. Um, a lot of times people will add a little bit of like leaf mulch or um, just some leaf layer. I don't like to mulch my leaves because I don't want to kill all the creatures that are in the leaves. So I usually just keep a good pile on hand um, that I can use from for, for tucking those plants in instead of using um, regular mulch or compost. We can use just like a aged bark mulch works fine. Um, try to avoid treated mulches and things like that when preparing sites. Um, but generally I say, if you get a good six inches of above ground growth, they're ready to go. Oftentimes um, the plants will even flower uh, by fall. We had quite a few of our plants flower this year um, before fall. Like the New England aster will probably start to flower. Um, in the summertime. And the big thing is, big reason why we say to wait until fall to plant is because it's cooler, um, it's less stress on the plant and it's less need to continually water. Like if your plant seems big enough and ready to grow, go in the ground in the summer, the fallback of planting in the summer is that you then have this like plant in the ground in a stressed environment that you now need to go out to and cater to all the time. Whereas like, if I have all my plants together in their pots all summer long, I can water them as needed and put them in the ground when they need less care and less tending to. Um, it's also important to understand your site area. Um, we talk a lot about right plant, right place, but also if you're in a place that has very, very high deer brows and things like that, you're gonna wanna um, put in some sort of temporary fencing to get those guys really established. Um, before you, you just like put them out and say, good luck. Um, uh, as far as like planting techniques, um, like I was saying before, when I divide my plants, I try to keep them in little groups of between like five and 10 individual plants. And I plant them in the ground just like that. Um, when I'm doing a planting, I like to have between three and seven or more uh, clumps to put in the ground. It's nice to do a good swath. Um, I find that it fills in really nice that way. There's something called like the landscaping triangle or something. You do kind of a um, offset naturally looking uh, triangle-y swath and it, it comes out looking pretty nice and they're able to fill in together and they're able to kind of protect each other and um, grow into their own and have a, a really nice display, if that makes sense. Awesome. And um, the maybe this will be a quick question then we can have time for one more um the uh, yeah and apologies to there's so many great questions um I don't think we're going to get to all of them especially some of the seed sowing tips and tricks of specific species but um there's some questions about like just transplanting in the or broadcasting on the ground versus planting in plot pots versus planting in milk jugs and just quickly like why we choose this method might be helpful Right. Yeah, that's a great question. We get this question all the time. Um, and really it comes down to uh, having the control over your plants um, and your seeds. It's very, very difficult to effectively broadcast seed and have them actually germinate and grow into plants. Um, if we think about, <laughs> I talk about this all the time, there's this 
ecology term that's probably a little outdated, but it, it's called the doomed surplus. And in the wild or like in you know nature, there's certain species, fish, frogs, plants that produce so much seed. Um, and that's because a huge percentage of them are not gonna grow up and turn into reproductive adults. Uh, most of them are gonna become food for something or they're gonna die one way or another. They're not gonna have the um, all of the, its needs met to become an adult that then is reproductive. Um, plants are the same way. If you're to just dump your seeds out, they're now open and available for becoming food, for getting washed away and ending up in conditions that aren't the best conditions for them to be able to germinate. Um, and for a whole other slew, like anything could happen to them. You're not in control of them anymore. Um, so that's kind of the biggest thing about um, broadcast seeding. If it's a very, very large area um, that you're trying to seed and you don't want to grow all of your seed, it is doable, but it does require some math. You need much more seed than you would for sowing in pots. Um, and you need a really prepared site without other competition of plants. Um, it's not going to work to throw seed out onto a mowed grass lawn because you're, they're going to be outcompeted by grasses that grow way faster than a seed can germinate. Um, like our grasses are even still green in some places. So they're not going to be able to outcompete those. Um, so that's a really big part. Um, Milk jugs, lots of people use milk jugs. Um, I just use these because I like to have standard pots and I'm growing in nursery care, um, but people swear by them. I, it's really, it's a reusable pot. It's essentially turning a pot into a milk jug. Um, the thing that I personally avoid is the greenhouse milk jug style, um, but that's personal preference. I just find that I have to keep an eye on the plants a lot more because um, it does create a greenhouse effect. And when the plant grows up, it can really easily... Um, get smothered by too much moisture and water and greenhouse effect, it gets cooked essentially in the pot. Uh, so you have to be a little bit more um, aware of what's happening with your plants. These guys I can put in a pot, put them outside, check them in the spring and have plants. Um, and it's, it's much more easy to do. And then I have these pots that I can move around and I can put them where I need them. I can transplant and, and really have control over where those plants go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And apologies if um, we did not get to your um, questions. There were so many questions. They were all really great. And um, yeah, we have somehow already filled up this hour. So I um, am going to um, sign us off and Andrea is gonna be place, putting some links in the chat. Um, but we are really grateful that you all spent this time here with us. If this information was useful and exciting, um, we would love to have you consider becoming a Wild Seed Project member. We are a member supported organization and with your membership, you will be able to come to our monthly Q and A's and ask any and all of these questions again to Emily and Tyler, um, who will diligently try and answer. Um, we also have our seed sale is live right now. You can go to our website to get seeds if you this if you didn't have seeds that you were thinking of sowing and this has excited you. We have um, planting guides um, that come out every year. This year we are talking about planting for climate resilience and are really excited to get that into people's hands. We have a um, plant sale every fall where we will be selling the plants that we have grown on. So um, if any of those things um, seem like things you want to be pursuing, I will be sending out an email, including this recording and the chat and the Q&A. Um, on Tuesday. So look out for that from me. And I just want to say thank you all for joining us. Um, we had such a joy today, a joyful time today, and um, we hope that you did too. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.